Welcome back to Faith Formation at Home. This week, our gospel is a continuation from last week's gospel. So remember last week, Jesus is in his hometown of Nazareth, and he goes and preaches in the synagogue. He reads from the scroll of Isaiah about the Spirit of the Lord being upon the Messiah so that he can do all these miracles. And then he sits down to teach, and he says, Today this is fulfilled in your hearing. Right? He's basically saying, I am the Messiah. This, this well-known Messiah passage from Isaiah, I'm saying, is fulfilled in me. Right? And nobody missed his, his meaning. So today we see what happens next. The reading picks up with that last line. Right, Jesus sits down and says, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now we get the people's response to it. Right? And it first says that everyone spoke highly of him and were amazed at the gracious words that he said. But then they started recognizing, like, we know this kid. Right? He grew up here. We know his parents. This guy can't be the Messiah. And then they get so frustrated that they take him up on a hill and they're going to throw him off the hill and kill him. And Jesus is able to walk through the midst of them because it wasn't his time yet, right? Uh, and so the interesting questions for us, right? Are we familiar with Jesus like these people at Nazareth were? Like familiarity breeds contempt, right? We're so familiar with Jesus that he's just a, he's a character in a book, right? Because if we're honest with ourselves, that's a much safer thing. If Jesus is just a character in a book, than if he's actually who he says he is. Because if he is who he says he is, then I might actually have to change my life. Right? There might be things I'm doing that aren't in accord with what he says, if he's actually God. But if he's just a character in a book, then I can listen to his nice words, I can take them for what they're worth, but I don't really have to do anything. right? And so we might be tempted to be like these folks in Nazareth. We're like, I've, I've, I've known about Jesus my whole life. I've been going to Mass my whole life. I've been teaching my kids about Jesus. right? If you're a kid, you're like, yeah, I know the story of Jesus really, really well. So what else do I need? Well, we need to actually believe it and realize that Jesus is real. So the challenge for us this week is, to: are we going to be like these folks in Nazareth who think like, yeah, those are nice things, right? We'll speak highly of you. Uh, or are we going to be like the disciples who changed their lives to follow Jesus and do what he wants? Our Bible story for little ones from the Jesus Storybook Bible is how to pray, right? And so the story starts off with talking about some of the, the super holy rich people, uh, uh, extra super holy people who would pray with all these big flowery words so that people could look at them and say, oh, those guys are really good prayers, right? And they prayed just so that people could, could notice them. And Jesus says, don't do that. Don't be like that, right? When you pray, you know, in the Sermon on the Mount, he talked about go into your room, close the door, pray in secret so your father in secret will hear you, right? So prayer isn't about showing off. It's not about saying the right things, uh, you know, using the right amount of words and all that sort of stuff. But don't let that make you think that the words aren't important. Because right? we've got all this beautiful prayer tradition in the church with all these wonderful prayers, the Glory Be, the Hail Mary, the Rosary, and specifically the Our Father. It's interesting, during this passage, when Jesus says, don't be like these guys who focus on all their words, what does Jesus do? He turns around and he gives us specific words to pray. So there's value in memorizing your prayers and knowing things like the Our Father. Now, the Our Father that's listed in here is going to be very different than the one that you hear at Mass, or that you've, you've hopefully memorized at this point, right? It starts off, hello, Daddy, we want to know you and be close to you. It's trying to explain what Jesus was getting at with those words of the Our Father. But it's good to know the real words of the real Our Father, right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and it goes on. Because when you can't just pray from the heart, when you're so frustrated or angry or depressed or even excited that you can't find words, those memorized prayers are good to go to then. Or if you want to pray with somebody else, it's hard for me to pray with you if you're making it up and I'm making it up and we're just praying off the top of our heads, right? But if we both know the Our Father, we can sit down and we can pray together, right? And this is why Jesus gives us a specific prayer, the Lord's Prayer or the Our Father to pray. Not to keep us from praying from the heart and in our own words, that's incredibly important. But it's to give us another tool in our toolkit for talking to God when, when we can't come up with some words. Some questions for our older kids uh, are going to get us into the Ten Commandments finally. So we start off at the beginning of this catechism in the orange section that talks about the big questions of life, right? Where do we come from? How can we know that there's a God? What is his purpose for us? Why did he make us in the first place, right? And then if we can establish that there is a God, what do we know about him? What can we believe about him? So the yellow section goes through the creed, right? Those 12 articles of faith, things that we can know about God for certain that cover the basis of the faith, right? So if we know that there's a God and we know what we believe about him, how are we supposed to live that, right? So the first section of that is the orange section or the sacraments, these liturgical encounters with God, ways for God to get inside of us, things that we can do to actually get close to this God that we believe in. But then what do we do with our actual lives outside of a liturgical setting? That's this blue section on the Ten Commandments, right? And so it's going to talk to us a bit in general about 
uh, the Ten Commandments in general, and then the last questions here are going to focus on the very first and most important commandment. You should only have one God, the real God. All right? And what's interesting about these commandments and what I love about this catechism's approach to them is every commandment, it's going to talk about what this commandment means and how you keep it, but it's also going to talk about what this commandment protects us from. Because that's what rules do. Right? Parents, you know this. The reason your kids aren't allowed to play in a busy street is because you don't want them to get hit by a bus. Right? You, you want to protect them. Rules are there to protect us. So why does God give us rules? What is he protecting us from? This first commandment, he wants us to know who he is and not fall for some fake God. Right? In the ancient world, and maybe even in the modern world, people would sometimes worship rocks and sticks and trees and things like that. We had, we had a wrong idea of who the real God was right, and is. Uh, God is not a rock. God isn't a statue, as beautiful as a statue might be. God isn't a spring of water or a wind or the force or anything like that, right? God is much bigger than anything that's created. So he wants us to have the right idea of what is God in the first place. Who is he? What is he about? But secondly, God doesn't want to sell us, sell us short, right? And so in the modern world, we don't necessarily worship rocks and sticks and trees anymore. We tend to worship things like money and popularity and people liking us and promotion and status and all that sort of stuff. And what God is trying to tell us with this commandment is those things are not God. They're not ultimately going to satisfy. And we all have experienced this when we're honest with ourselves. We recognize, right? I get the promotion and I'm excited for a while. And then I realize, like, there's got to be more than this, right? Um, your favorite team wins the Super Bowl or the Stanley Cup or the World Series or whatever. And you're excited for a day. And then, you know, a couple weeks later, you're like, well, it'd be nice if we win another one, <laughs> right? None of this stuff satisfies. You really, really, really want that toy for Christmas. And then you get it and it's exciting for a while and you like having it. And then you realize it's, it doesn't actually make me happy. Right? That's because none of these things are God. And that's what God is trying to protect us from with this commandment, is to recognize the only thing, the only thing that will make us happy in a lasting sort of way is God and recognizing who he is. 